Okay, so I started with Psalm 34 verse 1 that says, I will bless the Lord at all times. His praise shall continually be in my mouth. And that's a lovely song by Nathaniel Bassi featuring the son Onion Kong. Now, the song means, it means I worship you. There is a part in the song that says, you are eminently glorious, magnificent, and powerful. Sometimes, you know, when I get to heaven, I really want to know what God really looks like. I know that I've explained to him. I have seen, you know, I have seen in visions. But then, there is this glory of God that I really want to see for myself. I know him in his crown, golden, fire, a lion, and everything all around him. What about you, Francis? Well, I think um, meeting God on earth is one thing. Getting to be with him in heaven is another thing. But as we grow in a spiritual journey, mm -hmm. you never can tell if God will choose to give you all that <laughs> revelation while you're here on earth before you join him in heaven. But of course, today is Worship Experience Special, and we are privileged and Very highly privileged. honored to host this amazing personality. Now, if you are in Nigeria and outside the shores of Nigeria, the African continent, there are names that comes up and you literally know the personality mm -hmm. behind it. I mean, you can't mention a uh, full life uh, Christian center without the personality we are bringing to you this morning. You can't talk about youth and godly living without the personality we're bringing this morning. You can't talk about merging the 21st and the olden centuries, mm -hmm. all the generation put together and you know, a fine blend of the gospel of Christ yes. and then helping the younger generation specifically to find purpose. Mm -hmm. And it takes my mind to the crop of um, pastors that we have mm -hmm. who have been able to move away from the ancient ways of yeah. focusing on just spirituality mm -hmm. without actually helping the individuals find God for okay. themselves, That's which true. is the whole map of growing that spirituality. Join us and make welcome to Worship Experience Special. We're talking about the president of Full Life Foundation. He's an accountant by training. Yeah. Of course, um, a marriage and relationship coach, a pastor per excellence. I mean, if we were to spend time to look into the bio of these amazing personality, we will not get started and the day will be off and gone. But join us as we welcome live on set very reverent i don't know i said correct <laughs> but i might like to add that title reverend Ntia Ntia. good morning and welcome to watch me experience morning, thank you very much god bless you god bless you and too i'm glad to be here everyone joining god bless you good morning welcome okay i mean the voice has not changed you know that voice when you get to church you get to and, and you're expecting and then he just speaks the mark of morning church in a monday service or in a service on sunday you're like yeah that's the voice that brought me to you this morning. <laughs> okay, so let's just delve deep into today's discussion because trust me, we don't, I won't say we don't have time, but you'll be shocked how time will run we'll so fly. quickly. So, today we want to discuss some purpose. As someone who has discovered purpose, so I want to start with what we call Gen Z. Now, Gen Z is, um, we, we call it Indomie generation, even though I, I don't like that word. <laughs> because then, you belong to them, <laughs> No, I'm not. But then, um, in the Gen Z world, some youth believe, you know, that you have to make it quick. You have to earn six figures, get married, have two kids, and then jack my out of Nigeria. So I'm wondering, in our generation, okay, in the Gen Z generation, do you think that the idea of pursuing purpose or discovering purpose will still be relevant again? I think that everybody's a reflection of the information they have had, had access to. Mm -hmm. The Gen Z generation, I must say, have not had the wealth of information imparted to make them think in a more stable manner. Mm -hmm. So because of that, most parents um, tell themselves, I don't want my child to go through what I went through. Yes, that's true. So because of that, there is a loss of body of experience mm -hmm. required to stabilize a life right from home. So much of the, the grounding that the previous generations went through, most parents, um, in an attempt to help and make life better for their children, actually end up robbing the children of the wealth of instruction mm -hmm. and the, the quality of experience required to ground a person okay. 
in in the in the search of reality. So many uh, people in the Gen Z generation were raised on a fantasy. Parents are determined to make life better, so parents are not available, so instruction is scarce, so the children live life in a fantasy. TV, media, Facebook, and so on and so forth. So this is what has informed the mindset of the Gen Z generation. Well, we now have to introduce to the generation a body of knowledge, instruction, required to let a person know that life does not just uh, amount to how quickly you can get what you think you want mm -hmm. because you can spend all the time pursuing what you think you want only to get it and discover that's not what you need. So because of that, the Gen Z generation need to encounter knowledge. And I believe that where they have the opportunity to hear what they've not heard and learn what they've not learned, there's actually a change of mindset and they become more mature, more stable. Now they combine that speed of, uh, of pursuit with now an awareness of a greater purpose. In other words, life is more than clothes. Life is more than shoes. Life is more than a job. Life is more than getting married. Life is more than giving birth to children. That level of maturity comes through knowledge. So purpose is relevant to anyone who will just get to know that indeed, you, no matter what you, you, you try to do, you are not running away from purpose. You're just substituting a purpose with reality with a purpose with fantasy. So purpose with reality and purpose with fantasy. Do you mind taking us back to what um, your generation or your youthful age was like? I know what your parents did different that the parents in the Gen Z generation are not doing. When I was growing up, yes. parents, my parents were more available. Oh. That's the first thing. Parents are out looking for job. Parents are out trying to make money to earn a living, to make a better living. Because of that, there's that scarcity of parenting. Okay. But in our time, parents first and foremost were available. So what would you say this purpose really is? And at what age did you discover your purpose? Purpose is discovering the ultimate intention of your creator for creating you. You are God's creature. He created you with an intent. Purpose is the mind of the maker behind the making. Purpose is the design or rather the dream that necessitated the design. So that dream, that mind, that idea, that reason that necessitated your making is purpose. Mm -hmm. No product defines its purpose. Every product takes its purpose from the reason why it was produced by its manufacturer. Mm -hmm. And so at any point in time where a person encounters God, now the very first purpose I discovered was the fact that man needs God. Man needs God. I need to know my maker. That was the first purpose I did. Why? Because my parents would take me to a scripture union as children, and you began to hear. Now, one thing the Bible tells us is that faith comes by hearing, mm -hmm. and hearing by the word. In other words, if you start hearing the word of God, the word of God will teach you to hear. Mm -hmm. Inside the word of God, you will hear what you need to hear. And so the first thing I began to discover is that God created me and God is interested in me and I need to know God. And so that happened. And I, I gave my life to Jesus in that scripture union camp. And then from there, I began to become um, aware of the fact that I didn't create myself. I was created for a purpose. Okay, so I'm just thinking, is purpose limited to just Christians? Because... You just said that one of your the one one of the first ways you discovered purpose was you know you found God. So can we say now that purpose is something that is only meant for Christians? Purpose applies to every area of life. Okay. There's a purpose for your education. There's a purpose for your career. There's a purpose for your relationship. But it depends on what you're exposed to. 
early enough. All right. Now, going to school, the first thing, thing you learn in school is you learn the basics of education. You don't actually know why and what you will use education for. You learn English, you learn mathematics, and then you begin to discover a liking in you for certain subjects and a liking in you and a passion in you for certain courses. Now, it is out of this liking for the certain subjects and certain passions that you now begin to aspire to where this subject and courses will take you to. Now, I grew up thinking I'll be a medical doctor. Why? Because my father was a medical doctor. Mm. And so my father exposed me to the medical field. He would take me to the hospital with him. He would take me to go see his patients on his ward round. So because I was surrounded by the medical field and medical doctors and nurses, I began to think that I will be a medical doctor. Passion began to develop. So you see that it's not only in the area of godliness. Now, my parents were Christians before, before we came. So early enough, they began to lead us into prayer in the home, the family altar, and then going to church. So because of that, I was exposed through their knowledge of God to the spirituality of purpose. So because they were educated, because they, 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 they took education seriously, they sent us to school, I discovered purpose in education. Because he was a medical doctor, I began to discover passion and the possibility of a purpose in the medical field. So this is how purpose, purpose is developed in different aspects of life. You know, that's why people say that you show me your friends and I'll tell you who you are. It's the same with your environment will shape you. The kind of parents you have will shape you. So if we have wholesome parents, there is a greater chance of the next generation discovering purpose on time because they will expose the next generation to the things that will trigger awareness of the possibility of purpose. And you realize that a child finds direction earlier in life if that child is guided by proper parenting, sound education, and a healthy environment. Okay. So, Pastor, my, my next line of question for you would be, does purpose equate success and success in the worldview of wealth, materialism? Does it always equate that? Purpose does not always equal material success. But purpose is a level of success. In other words, success meaning an achievement or attainment of a set goal or an aim. So finding purpose might not equal acquiring material success. But finding purpose will bring you to a level of fulfillment, a level of wholeness, a level of fullness. Being where you ought to be brings you to a level of peace. Now, that can be a good foundation to attaining material success because it will help you take wholesome decisions. Our material success is a product of the decisions and choices we make and act on over time. So it can lead to material success, but not necessarily will amount to material success. But there are many people that are happy and satisfied and fulfilled in life because they found their purpose, even though they might not have found material success yet. Okay, now, still going back to the material success conversation, um, Emilio made mention of the fact that today's generation, we are all talking about Japan. Mm -hmm. Everybody's all about hammering. And uh, when you stay in a particular field, for instance, you're a medical doctor, and then everybody turns around and see you're not, you know, materially where people expected you're going mm -hmm. to be. Or you're a pastor, and you're not materially where people felt you're supposed to be at that particular mm -hmm. time. People kind of feel like finding purpose is a total waste of time. Yeah. So. To this class of people, how do we begin the conversation of changing their mindset towards finding purpose? Instruction is powerful. And it's never too late to introduce a person to wholesome instruction. In an environment plagued by poverty, people are in touch with the pain of their need, the pain of their lack. And so that shifts their mindset. The, 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 the law of nature is survival. 
So once a person is plagued with the mindset of lack and poverty and want, the next thing is to just look for how to survive. And the farther you are from that experience of poverty and lack, the safer you will think you will be. So everybody in such a society will be tempted to think materialistically. I need to get out of poverty. That is why to a great extent, governance, leadership, beginning from family, mm -hmm. plays a great role in stabilizing society. In stabilizing society. If a person's basic needs are met, even the Bible said having food and raiment, let's be content. Mm -hmm. So contentment requires a basic supply of life's needs once those things are in place people now stand a healthier chance a better chance at thinking in a balanced perspective however knowledge can still override the basic instincts of survival knowledge can still override it. so we need to let people know that life is not all about acquisition of wealth because once you get into that habit of the greed for acquiring wealth it is a learned habit you cannot unlearn it and that is why people get to a point where no amount of money is enough that's why people steal that's why people are corrupt so you realize that in a society that is underdeveloped plagued by poverty plagued by lack people get into the habit of greed the habit of thinking if i have more it is better mm -hmm. and once you are hooked on that addiction you realize that there's no end to wanting to have more and more and more and more and more so even the person that grew up poor and didn't like the poverty and therefore wants to have and wants to have more all of a sudden gets into the habit of wanting to have more and by the time he finds himself in a position where he should address the poverty he did not like the addiction and the habit of wanting more makes him steal the resources he ought to use to better the life that he once told himself that no matter what he will try to do things better because addiction will always overrule reasoning okay just just before i let him in your comment um, in your earlier statement, Pastor, you took us back to how you grew up and the role your parents played. Yes. Would you say we are doing enough in training the next generation of parents? Because if the family is the first route where we are being given the basic things that we need before we even get to the academic environment um, through all of the schools bringing up these days, yeah. that means if we get it wrong at the family level, then the child is doomed already, unless by some special intervention. Absolutely. Absolutely. Once we get it wrong in the family, you can renovate the windows, you can renovate the roof, you can renovate the walls. How do you renovate the foundation? It will take an absolute demolition. So because of that, once we get it wrong at the stage of parenting, what can schools do? So you carry a child that has been dysfunctional from home to a school. What can the school do? You cannot beat knowledge into his brain. Or you take him from there to church. What can the church do? The church can engage the power of God and the word of God. But even that is subject to the will of man. So you realize that that formative stage matters so much. Now, how do we help the parent help the child? Back to the information. But it's going to take a longer process. It's going to take a longer time. So people will say churches are everywhere. Yet the society is bad because... You can't fix the problem from the top. You got to fix the problem from the foundation. But at the time you are meeting the person you are ministering to in church, you are not ministering to a child. You are ministering to an adult. adult. So the job of transforming an adult is a task far, far, far more difficult than we appreciate. Okay, so before I ask the next question, I would like to say that this is audience participatory. That means the phone um, the phone numbers will be on the screen for you to call in and ask relevant questions. So now, earlier you talked about purpose with fantasy and purpose with reality. Do you mind giving us more clarity on that? Yes. When I mean purpose with fantasy, 
I mean, convincing yourself that certain things are what pursuing as your purpose, whereas they are mere fantasies. For example, if I can have the latest car, I'll be happy. Will you? <laughs> no, you won't. And that is why those who are into cars, they don't stop at one car. They go for the next car. And they go for the next car. So it is now about the thrill of acquisition, not the satisfaction of ownership. Fantasy. Next, when too many people have cars, you now want to have something that many don't have. Private jets. Got to have my private jet. Or so manufacturers start having limited editions. So they say this, we only make 10. 10. You are one of the 10 in the world that has it. So it's about building a fantasy as a purpose, but there's no end to it. But then when you talk of reality, for example, your health. How much is your health worth? A sick person in the hospital, does he care about who won his car that morning? No. All right. What of a person that is in a coma and you put $1 million by his side? Can he get up and count the money? No. What if somebody that has an estate that he is down with a terminal sickness and he realizes that there's a treatment and that the cost would be the price of his estate. Will he sell that estate and fly for that treatment? Yes, he will. So you realize that when we actually come to the to the to the to where the rubber meets the road, reality is so different from fantasy. At that point in time, sometimes it's too late. So one of the greatest realities a person can have is knowledge, knowing God. Building a, a wholesome family. Look at this. People sacrifice their relationships to have money. And then when they have money, they now use money and look for relationships. Mm -hmm. So it's, it's, it's a vicious cycle of fantasy versus reality. Of what you think you want versus what you find out you need. And by then, sometimes what you have lost is it recovery? But, but Pastor, doesn't that defeat the purpose of relationship? Because um, love, friendship cannot be bought by material things. So people now returning to use well to try and gain back relationship. Doesn't that defeat the purpose? They never find real relationship. In other words, you hear somebody say, man, right now I don't know if it's me they love or my money they love. <laughs> And there's no way to know it. You've left the stage where you could have known no it. Needs, yeah. I don't know whether it means the love of my position. <laughs> Sorry. You just have to gamble. You just have to hope for the best. And so because of that, uh, the, the reality of knowing the things that matter early enough in life is important. Okay. So that those core decisions, the values and the principles and the relationships that are built at that stage is what you carry. So at the point where you acquire wealth, you acquire fame, you acquire position, you already know who knows you and who you know. And so you are able to make a choice, not based on where you are today, but based on the structure you had built yesterday. And because of that, it's possible to be wealthy and happy. It's possible to be successful and happy. It's possible to be influential and happy because you laid the right foundation yesterday okay so talking about laying um, the right foundation early i want to ask so what are these steps let's say someone is motivated now and they want to start discovering their purpose what are those basic things that they are meant to know on this journey the very first thing i will recommend if you want to know your purpose understand that your life is subdivided into different categories that's the first thing you need to know mm -hmm. And it is not a one thing fits all. You are, you are, your spiritual life is different from your career life, different from your relationship life, different from your family life. You must understand that. And so you want to now begin to tell yourself, how do I fix these different aspects of my life? 
And the first aspect you, I will recommend you should fix is your spiritual life. Because except the Lord build us. Now, it has been scientifically proved that people of faith, people that have a faith, people that have a, a body of belief and conviction that is morally grounded, they become better and more wholesome citizens of any society. So the first thing is for you to know I need the knowledge of God in my life. And I would gladly let you know that God wants you to know him. And God wants you to have a relationship with him. And all you need to do as a Christian is say, Jesus, come into my life. Be my Lord and my Savior. He will answer. He will come in. That's the beginning. Now the next thing is you need to realize that your spirituality affects your choices and your decisions. So you realize that you have made wrong decisions in the area of relationships, in the area of career, in the area of family. Maybe you've hurt family members, people that could have been there for you, people that could have counseled you, advised you. You've hurt them. Guess what? Start fixing those relationships. Everybody needs advice, needs counsel, needs input. The only thing better than one good head is two good heads. And so start fixing your family relationship. Start reconciling with the people who truly love you for you. Those are the people that will be able to speak into your life, give you advice, balance your life. Next thing you got to tell yourself is, where am I going to with respect to my career? What do I want to do with my life? What do I want to... Now, God will help you. God will guide you. And good people, quality people in your life will also guide you, advise you. Now they'll look at your potentials, your skills. I dropped out of school, so 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 alright. So what where did you stop? What did you know? So what are the subjects? So you see that with that you begin to now gradually fix the pieces of the puzzle of life together. Now I I, I said that you must understand that your life is in different compartments because the tendency of people in problem is they want one thing that fixes everything. But it doesn't happen that way. It was not one thing that destroyed everything. And one thing cannot fix everything. But by the time you fix your purpose in one area, realize that there's more peace. And with that peace, you're able to take a better decision for the next area. And there's more peace. And you can so once you fix your relationship with God and your relationship, and you can't fix it, come to God to help fix you. And then your relationship with family. You now realize that there are people that will tell you, don't worry. You might have to start afresh. Don't worry. Right jump again. It's okay. No problem. And with the support of these people who are ready to believe in you at your what stage, you just realize you can face the world. And you go there, write that exam again. And then you go back to your first year. And you come back and they mocked you in class. And they looked at you and said, what is this fellow looking for here? And then you come home and some voices are saying, don't worry. Be strong. You're on the way. And you realize that with this balancing voice of the right people, you can survive the world. Now, the same people that are mocking you today, tomorrow will use you as an example exactly. to others. I know this man who, despite everything he loves, he went back to school. You too can go back to school. But at the point where you are paying that price, they might not be the best of your supporters. But if you have God and you have family, to a great extent, there's somebody to say, keep going. And you realize that your life becomes more peaceful and more orderly. By the time you meet a person in the state where he has found and built purpose, he does not look like what he went through. Why? Because he's been, he had, had God and had the right people there to help talk to him. Okay, so we're going to go on a short break. When we return, we're still talking about purpose and we are gradually going into leadership in ministry. So just stay with us. This is Worship Experience Special Edition.
What is the final statement over your life? Believe this Advantage series on Warship Experience brought to you exclusively by Spectrum Television. Warship Experience is at it again. This time, set to play host to a purpose discoverer, an inspirational and motivational teacher, and a youth ministry champion who has traversed and scaled many hurdles on his gospel missionary adventure. We must be able to monetize value. I want you to know how money can... Hook up to Spectrum TV for this exclusive chat with Reverend Ntia I. Ntia, the senior pastor of Full Life Gospel Ministry. Date, Friday, 3rd May 2024. Time, m. Join us on this trip towards unraveling the mysteries of the kingdom as we continue engaging the voices that matter on Worship Experience. Keep a date. The first service of full life was four people. Then we became five. Then we became nine. Then a breakthrough happened. We became 13. We had an eight day program Sunday to Sunday. In fact, practically, that was that was just that week of visitation. The first service we had, the broken down car of the landlord was still inside the hall. Twenty-one years later, see where we are. See where we are. As a ministry, we have everything to be thankful for. For moving us from a boat, moving us to Women Development Center, to Ibom Hall. Moving us from Ibom Hall to Dominion Hall. Moving us from Dominion Hall to Old Noah's Ark. Moving us from Old Noah's Ark to Celebration Arena. Moving us from Celebration Arena to the new Noah's Ark. And one day he will move us from the new Noah's Ark to the crown of glory sanctuary. Come on, give your God a prayer. That is how your life will be moving from glory to glory. From beauty to beauty. From grace to grace. From greatness to greatness. Can a real believer give God a shout of praise? you don't have money have a vision even if you don't have support have a vision even if you don't have friends have a vision even if you don't have helpers have a vision today and provision will come tomorrow have a vision today and support will come tomorrow have a vision today and sponsorship will come tomorrow have a vision today and 
fog will come tomorrow have a vision today and importance will come tomorrow have a vision today and respect will come tomorrow have a vision today and friends will come tomorrow have a vision today and regard will come tomorrow have a vision today and honor will come tomorrow whatever else you do not have make sure you can sing This is Worship Experience Special coming to you live on Spectrum Television and we're beaming live from here, the capital city of Aquibum State. And as usual, uh, we have a very big uh, fish in the house in the Nigerian parlance and uh, we are talking purpose, leadership, ministry and how you can rediscover, reinvent and go ahead to become a better person. And yes, of course, just before we took that time out, we're still talking about the early stage of Pastor Reverend Ntia I Ntia was he's the president of Full Life Christian Center. But just before we get back to the conversation, of course, you know, at some point in time, the phone lines will be open for you to join the conversation, ask those critical questions as far as purpose, ministry is concerned. Of course, um, you also can connect us just in case you're not in the confines of your house on the go at spectrumtvlive.ng as we're currently streaming on our social media platforms. But coming back to the house, Reverend, just watching and listening to your conversations and of course um, some of the insights that we have my mind runs back to my first encounter with pastor someone one of your son in the lord mm -hmm. and i remember the city of a kid seemingly was dead until his emergence uh, especially for the um the students community so i like to ask before we even go into the ministry is there a particular focus of your ministry and those who started ministry through you are you committed to the youthful? Because that, that some persons are like, I'm focused on the youth population. Yeah. Is there some specific attached to your core and your ministry? Yes, we, we are focused on, first of all, everyone. That you can reach everyone at the same time. So the focus, first of all, is 15 to 55 and there's no way you focus on 15 to 55 0 to 15 will be affected mm -hmm. and 55 to whenever we are affected so that balance bridges both the incoming generation and the outgoing generation, generation. so that has been our our mindset and focus that designs our message our methods and uh, it's so far, we believe that with, because that generation will mentor others. The 15 year old will mentor the younger ones. And the 40 to 55, uh, that is where the elderly generation will emerge from. So once you can affect that, the rest with time will be affected. So that has been our focus. Okay, so um, focus is very well defined. I, I like to come from a different perspective. You talked about 15 to about 45 or 55. Yeah. yeah. That means a whole lot is being sorted out. Now, in the event that people have gone to, let's say, let's move past 15, get to 20, 30, they already parents themselves and they missed out on the basic foundation. Yeah. What programs does the church have to handle this group of person? By the grace of God, the word of God is so powerful that it can rewind a person's life experience to fix the foundation and then accelerate a person into gains today. So the word of God is presented with that perspective that it doesn't matter what went wrong in your past. The word of God today, the Bible says it pierces to the dividing asunder. So it can pierce 
to your past. Fix what went wrong and accelerate your recovery so that you start having the games today. So because of that, there's a spiritual content that you need because he who comes to God must believe that it's possible. So there's a spiritual content of faith, of the spiritual content of vision. There's a spiritual content of, 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 of self-discovery. What God put inside of you because the gifts and the callings of God are without repentance. And there's a, a content of growth to maturity so that you can take advantage of these truths, truths of life, and walk with God. So that's the purpose of our meetings, our messages. We have the foundation class where we, we ground you in these basic truths. And if, from there, you now enter into, you know, we, we emphasize so much on the word because we know that the word of God is God's instrument for rebuilding any broken or battered destiny. And then, of course, we have provision. Now, the church is organized with departments, and these departments have specialized focuses. For example, if you have a medical situation, we have the Balm of Gilead department. We have the legal department. Okay. And so, so these departments mentor you in any aspect of life. But the basic foundation of your spirituality and your discovery of who you are in God takes place. And then we now assign you to different subgroups where you are now mentored with respect to peculiar situations. And in that way, we are seeing a lot of people rediscovering their purpose and finding their path in life. Okay, so Full Life will be 24 years this year. And the Full Life started in 2000. And this coming June, you are going to be 24 years. And over time, we've seen you actually move. You know, we've seen you at Ibom Hall, from Ibom Hall, Ibom Boat, and then you went to Noah's Ark. And just when we thought we've seen it all, you, we went to Celebration Arena, went to New Noah's Ark, and this year, we now move to Crown of Glory. So I want to ask, when do you always know that it's time to move? What's your, how do you judge it? Is it by the members or by access, um, finances? How do you always know when to transition from one phase to another? When you're on a spiritual journey with God, God signals your moves. Mm. You must be led by the Spirit of God. And life is like pregnancy. There's a beginning point. And when the pregnancy begins to get to delivery, signals begin to come. The mother starts having contractions. There's a discomfort. There is a staring that begins to let you know, hey, some, the next phase is about to open up. That is the way God leads you. As many as are led by the Spirit of God, they are the sons of God. And that would then make you go into prayer. Lord, what are you saying? Lord, what are you saying? You begin to seek God for clearer discernment. David said, one thing have I desired of the Lord, that will I seek after, that I may dwell in the house of the Lord to behold his beauty. So in the process of seeking, you begin to behold. We are looking into the word of God, the mirror of God, the glass. We are, we are transformed into the same image. So you see, once that discomfort begins, so, so sometimes there's a signal. In the, now, God can bring that signal through different things. It can be necessitated by Need can be necessitated by uh, growth. Lord, what are you saying? Lord, this place is too small for us. What are you saying, Lord? And then that's seeking. Whatever it takes for God to bring you to where you begin to sense that there is a shift coming, and then you begin to seek Him for clarity, for direction. Then you become more sensitive. You then come to the point where you now receive the signal. It's time for the next phase. And once it is God that signals it, God will make it happen. Okay, so let's talk about the call of God. You know, I've never really heard someone say I was a lawyer and God called me to become a doctor. I've only heard someone say, I mean, let's use you as an example. You are an accountant by training and called by God into the pastoral ministry. So what does the call of God feel like? How does it do? Does it appear to you? Does it come and sit with you and eat and then it tells you it's time to become a pastor? How did God call you? Different people have different encounters, and this nobody has any right to box God and limit God just by your own encounter. But whatever encounters you may have, it must be guided, controlled by the Word of God. Mm -hmm. 
So in my case, I, I always, you know, grew up thinking I'll be a medical doctor. I, I was looking forward to being a medical doctor. But I knew that God is going to use me. Why? Because I had, had grown in my relationship with God. And so I knew that God is going to use me. So I was thinking, and that's how my father used to operate. My father used to preach, my father used to minister, my father used to teach, but he was also a medical doctor. So that mold was what I had in mind. I'm going to practice medicine and then serve God in my spiritual capacity, you know, and then professional capacity. But then, as I kept growing, I remember, you know, my, my, my jam form already field medicine. And then the word of the Lord was quickened in my spirit. At that time, I had not yet heard the audible voice of God, but I, I could hear the spirit of God. The word of the Lord was quickened in my spirit, all right, that you are not going to practice medicine. Mm. So I got up and I changed my job form. <laughs> right? I cleaned up medicine and I wrote, I, I was looking for a, any professional, if there was a one-year professional course, that's what I was looking for. <laughs> You know, so I looked for the shortest professional course because my concern was how will I convince my father that I'm not going to read medicine? So, what are you going to read? All right, so I said, okay, accounting, and I filled accounting there. Mm. You know, I knew I would not practice, but I had to. I believe that education is important to ground you to be able to communicate to your generation. So, once I had that staring in my spirit, and then I, had, I prayed and I had peace in my spirit. Because when God is leading you, one of the signs of his leading is peace. So because of that, I went ahead with that. And um, here am I today, no regret. <laughs> okay. Now, capacity is one of the things you mentioned while you were talking. And I'd like to focus a little bit there. Um, like you rightly stated, the church plays a very critical role, just like the family. But we've had a lot of what Nigerians would call non-God-like gospel or mm -hmm. preaching coming from the pulpit. Yes. Gospel or messages that does not edify the individual or lead the person to God, let alone open the individual up to information and access to things that will help them be better. Mm -hmm. So the place of the lack of capacity or the ability on the part of preachers now comes into play. And most preachers, just like we say politicians, are not interested in capacity for the mm -hmm. except of recent when we begin to see that happen. So how do we get to know the right place to worship, to access both the word of God and the kinds of teachings that will further strengthen our moral stand and then expose us to the things that will help us grow? The Bible says, seek and you shall find. So many people miss or find the wrong thing because of what they were seeking. Many are seeking solutions because of pressing problems. Okay. Many are seeking escape from poverty. Let's face it, that's, that's what's plaguing our society. Lack, poverty, need, deprivation. So this triggers a search and many times when you are driven by needs, you are impatient with process. So because of that, you program yourself to look for what is the easiest way out of this need. And in a society where there is a desperate search for what comes easy. And now you know that everything genuine, everything sound Valley requires process. You want to make money legitimately, process. You want to get married legitimately. You must be ready to deal with your family, deal with your in-laws family, process. You want to get a land legitimately, process. So because of a society where people are desperate to get out of needs quickly, there's a search for alternatives. So you tell somebody, this thing will require, you need to take these antibiotics three a day for one month. Doctor, is there nothing else I can take faster? <laughs> is there no so because of that, there is, a, there is a demand. Consciously or unconsciously, there's a demand for alternatives. Yes. And because of that, the devil and 
dubious people provide that alternative. alternative. However, that alternative is fake, mm -hmm. is sharp. So you get to the office and you say, please, I was to come and submit my forms, but I didn't come with my passport. Somebody will provide an alternative. No, no problem. Bring the form. I will help you submit it. Bring me your passport next week. But it might be deceiving you. Mm -hmm. So people want a shortcut. They want, and the shortcut in life is that there's no shortcut. They want an alternative. So because of that, there's a lot of charlatans, a lot of fakes, you know. And also, so it's where there are weak controls. Now, I don't believe that uh, uh, any society can be absolutely, totally controlled. I believe that the individual, first of all, needs to tell himself, if I go looking for a shortcut to meet my needs, I will likely fall into the wrong hands. Okay. You enter into a taxi or into a car and they are talking, I brought in these goods from Cameroon. Okay. Do you know what it takes to bring goods from Cameroon legitimately? But because you want an easy way out, you fall prey. So people need to tell themselves, I am not going to look for an easy way out or a cheap way out or a quick way out. I want what is real and I want what is genuine. That then brings you to, how do I find what is genuine? Study the word of God. Pray, be sincere. Be sensitive. And of course, if it's too easy and too good to be true, it is not true. That's the truth. Pastor, yeah. studying the word of God, that, that's another area that, you know, is a major problem for the Christian Major people. problem. Now, when you talk about studying the word of God, I'd like you to elaborate a little more. Is it about the individual, like a medium and I, picking the Bible and submitting to God in the Bible and studying? Or we need to always turn to a man of God yes. to help us study the word of God. Both. Everything you know in life, you were taught. You were taught to walk. You were taught to talk. You were taught to recognize colors. Everything in life, you were taught. The human offspring is the most helpless creature on earth. Look at the antelope. Look at the giraffe. Look at the zebra. The baby is born, and in the next 15 minutes, he can run. The human baby. That guy is a problem for many years to come. <laughs> God designed it that way so that we will be dependent on instruction. We need to be taught. And the truth is that you can both teach yourself by reading and you can be taught by others. So you balance both. What you read by yourself will help you check what you are being taught. So that if somebody is teaching you wrong, you can say, wait, hold on a minute. That's not what I read. And then not... Uh, reading without being taught, you will run into things you don't understand because somebody knows more than you. Okay. So we need both. And both will balance the individual so that you don't have a pastor saying things that are not scriptural mm -hmm. and you just believe it just because he sounds eloquent. And you also are doing your own basic work of reading to prepare yourself so that as the pastor is teaching, you can flow with him on that frequency. So we need both. Open it and read. Just read. The same way you open the newspaper and read. same way you open your, your textbook and read. Just open the Bible and read. You see, it is the job of the communicator to communicate in a language his hearer understands. God knows that he has to speak to us in a way we can understand. So God has made provision for the word of God to impart that light that will help you understand. It. So just sincerely, Lord, I want to read my Bible today. Just start, and it will start entering, and then you are taught. And both you balance both, and you grow up. Okay, so let's just digress a bit. Um, of recent, there was this contention with God eating human food and God not eating human food. What's your take? Do you think that God can eat uh, material food? Like God can come First question, food? is there anything God cannot do? Absolutely not. Absolutely nothing. He might not want to do it, but not mean he cannot do it. So it's possible. Is there is anything too hard for the Lord? You see, we are the ones having problem. Have you heard God say anything? We are the ones having problem about what is not our problem. Somebody said, "I ate with God." Okay, what's your problem? What is your what's your challenge? How does that affect you? So we 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 chase after things that are not important. 
and we are distracted from the things that really matter. Okay, what is what is really impossible about God eating food? What is the big deal about it? I don't I don't see the the reason for the hue and cry. <laughs> because it is the least of our problems. If at all it's a problem. So I believe that a person can have encounters with God and that person will try his best to explain the encounter he had with God. As long as that encounter is not heretical, as long as that encounter does not take you off your foundation of walk with God, even that person will not be able to explain all Paul said, we, 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 we know in part. Yes. In other words, when you have an encounter with God, you can only understand, grasp it in part. And then you try to communicate it. Your vocabulary is limited. And so the person tries to say what, 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 he is, what, he's, what he's not able to fully understand. Our goal is to try to understand what is the insight. What he was communicating is intimacy with God. Mm -hmm. What it was communicating is how God wants to be close and not walk with God. How God wants to be close to us. How God, God looks for every way possible to, 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 to bond with man. And, and if a person has had depths of dimensions of closeness to God. It, is, it doesn't make that person special. It rather makes that person a model, an instruction, an invitation. Whatever God has done for one, he can do for another. Okay. And, and so we, it, it should rather spur us to seek a, a more intimate work with God. And more so it should make us begin to value our own experiences with God. Okay, so oftentimes we've heard this story, and not the story. Some 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 Christians believe that. So, so if you ask me, okay. the 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 person have that encounter with God? Yes, had that encounter with God. You tell me, did the person fully understand that encounter with God? No, and and the person never said he only fully understood it. Was the person able to fully communicate the depth of that encounter with God? No, but he did his best. Now, what should we do? There are many things in life. Have you ever seen your liver? Have you ever seen your kidney? Have you ever seen your heart? But it has not stopped you from growing in your knowledge of biology and anatomy. In the same way, we take the, the information that is consistent and balanced with the truth of God's word. And that balance, we must understand, refers to the, 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 the justice it does to already receive truth. I think that there are people that have that have already, uh, you know, that, that have stirred up more issues than that. So I think we should rather focus on <laughs> Why do on I feel how like we can be blessed <laughs> and balanced, you know, and not have problem with what doesn't, is not a problem. Okay, so um, some Christians believe that we should do away with the Old Testament because, you know, Jesus died and uh, the law and everything is gone. What's your take on that? I have two questions, actually. Also, what's your take on tithing? Do you think it's still relevant because we are living in a time where, you know, some Christians believe, look, um, tithing was an Old Testament law and it should not be practiced in the New Testament. What is your take on this? I believe that every part of the Word of God is important okay. and none of it should be discarded. Okay. Jesus came, yes, but why did he come? Jesus came, but why did he come? And when he came, what did he say about his coming and the law? Matthew 5, 17, think not that I am come to destroy the law or the prophets. I am not come to destroy, but to fulfill. I'm not come to destroy, but to fulfill. Simply put, don't misunderstand why I've come. It is not to cancel the laws of Moses and the writings of the prophets. No, I am come to fulfill them and to make them come true. Don't think that I have come to destroy the law of Moses or the teachings of the prophets. I've not come to destroy them, okay. but to bring about what they say. Okay, so that means that the Old Testament is irrelevant. Don't misunderstand why I've come. 
I did not come to abolish the law of Moses or the writings of the prophets. No, I came to accomplish their purpose. The important thing is, what was the purpose of the Old Testament? Instruction. Instruction. For example, the Old Testament says, thou shalt not steal. Did the New Testament say steal? So are you going to abolish thou shalt not steal? The Old Testament said, honor your father and your mother. Did the New Testament now say this, honor your father and your mother? No. Many, much of what we have in the New Testament is exactly what we have in the Old Testament. Well, somehow I feel that there is a Greek Bible that says something very different. Because of recent, that, we've been seeing Greek Bible interpretation coming into our generation of um, no, when people when people say Hebrew word says this, I would like to challenge any person. Get your Hebrew Bible is there online, and search that word. You will see that the Hebrew word any person is quoting has five, ten, fifteen, twenty different renditions. Mm that puts that word in certain different contexts. So when a person picks one Hebrew meaning and wants that to override all the other meanings, it does not, it does not work that way. You must do justice to the different renditions of that Hebrew interpretation. You get what I'm trying to say? Yes. And then balance that with other bodies of scriptural Mm. Balance that. So pe people know that when they say the Hebrew says, the Greek says, you that they are talking to, you don't have Hebrew Bible, you don't have Greek. So you believe what they are saying. The real translation is this: says who? Let's open and check. Okay, so let me. All right, I've come with my Hebrew Greek Bible. Let's open and check, and you realize that the Hebrew meaning is this and this and this and this and this and this and this. And the guy goes to lift number seven that fits into the narrative he wants and blows that out of proportion. Okay. And everybody believes that that is what the Hebrew says, that's what the Greek says. Whereas if you check again, you realize that there are other possible renditions that, also, that balances that scripture better than the point the person is trying to make. Okay, so Pastor, I, I'm going to ask this question for the generality of Nigerians, Africans, Christians, the world over. Because it seems like today's generation of preachers, most of them would prefer using Hebrew, mm. Latin. Yes. I, I come from the seminary background, and I know in the midst of the Latin and the teachings, we were also told that the emphasis and the importance of preaching the gospel is just so people will understand. Mm. So when you end up using Latin, where the average members of your church do not understand <laughs> Latin, <laughs> you are not preaching the gospel anymore. So I'd like to, is it important mm -hmm. for pastors to delve into Hebrews and the Greeks and bringing all of that into the church when in that particular church setting, the average church member does not have an Hebrew Bible or a Greek Bible or has no knowledge of any language called Greek or English. I will simply put it this way. It can be helpful. The essence of preaching and teaching is to bring understanding, clarity, and communicate truth with simplicity. Now, to the extent to which a preacher or any person in decides to search for clarity, seek for light is helpful but when the motive or the usage of that information is to present a narrative that disconnects people okay. farther from okay. clarity simplicity and understanding me, then sorry. the purpose of the hebrew and the greek is, is I think we have a call okay good morning Hello, welcome good morning. to worship experience Hello, good morning. Okay, I think we lost connection okay. there. Uh, Pastor, you, you, you've, you've, you've listed that out. And um, I just want a little more, a little more elaboration on that. Mm -hmm. Because even if you go to the local churches, for instance, you find pastors stand up on the pulpit 
and they themselves have no full grasp of the Hebrews and the language that is okay. Let's just take this call. Good morning, welcome to Worship Experience. Oh my goodness, I think the networks are at it. Uh, please feel free to connect us. The phone numbers are on your screen, and when you do call, remember to turn down the volume of your TV and, of course, um, tell us your name and where you're calling us from, and then go ahead with your question. So, Pastor, back to that same question Is it especially in the community level where you know that even the pastor that is preaching and using Hebrew and Greek from the pronunciation of the word itself is not getting it right. So if you can't get the pronunciation right, how can we be even sure that you can get the interpretations right? Like I said, it can be helpful. Mm -hmm. Tools are useful. Tools are helpful. As long as they are used with the right motive and they are used with the right purpose and with the right intent. Now, a person might speak and want to use a word in Hausa. Let him have an understanding of Hausa. Then he can then interpret it and explain it, and the people will understand why he went to bring a Hausa word. Likewise with Yoruba, likewise with Greek, likewise with Hebrew. But the goal should be to bring the people into clearer truth, not to cause contradictions, confusion, tension, not to be controversial for controversy's sake. Mm. Clarity, balance, harmony. Bring the people to a clearer understanding of truth. It is helpful and it can be useful when it is used with the right motive. But then you see, when some people notice that other people seem to have gotten some level of height by using Hebrew and Greek. So they think, oh, well, if I go use Hebrew and Greek, people also think I'm, you know, I'm grounded. Right. It's not necessary. The purpose is clarity. Now, if you can draw on the Hebrew and the Greek to bring greater clarity, why not? But it must be done with the right intent, the right purpose. And, and we'll keep building the body. Okay, so there is this um, one save, forever save, that is you know, really trending right now. What's your take? Do you think that once you're saved, you're forever saved, all salvation can be lost along the line? I, 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 I used to tell people, um, it is not, the Bible says, take heed. Okay. That's what the Bible says, take heed. The Bible says, depart from iniquity. The Bible says, don't continue in sin. Now you say, if I continue in sin, what will be the end? I don't want to find out. And I don't want you to find out. Okay, Pastor, please let us, let's hold on to that. Thought. Good morning. Welcome to Watch Me Experience Special. Your name and where you're calling us from? Hello, good morning. Hello, good morning. Please, I'm calling from Abia State. Your name, please. Okay. I do hope the network will be fair with us, but please, once you're able to connect us, just tell us your name and where you're calling us from, and then go ahead to share your comments, contributions, or you can also ask questions and then get clarity on it. So, Pastor, um, coming back to you. I know that our time is like running. It literally, a million said time flies. Seriously, let's come back to a very critical area. Hello, good morning. Yes, good morning. Yeah, good morning. What's your name? Okay, uh, my name is Isaiah. I'm a Bible school student. I'm calling from Portaco. I just want to say something about that Old Testament and the New Testament. I want to pass up. Okay, go ahead. Okay, you know. Old Testament is the word of God. New Testament is the word of God. So the word, that, that's what just I said, that my word shall not miss where any of them accomplished. So we need to understand the Old Testament is the same as what the New Testament is the Old Testament is right now. Because uh, if you want to say the book of Revelation, that blessed are those that believe the word of the prophecy, for none of them shall miss where they accomplished. Just guys also say that even ahead shall not stop my word from manifesting show that there's nothing that can stop the word of God from manifesting. So some people don't believe in Old Testament, that's why they say they don't say tight. That the New Testament is not talking about tight. Which the Bible says in the book of that if your righteousness is not more than the Father's new, you're not going to enter the kingdom of God. So all that we are studying in the, the New Testament now, we need to believe and even do more. 
right, thank you very much, Isaiah, for joining us. Uh, I, I think Isaiah is joining us. Yeah, he, he, he further emphasizes the fact that much of what we have in the New Testament is consistent with what we have in the Old Testament. Testament. So Jesus did not come to discard the Old Testament. Okay. He came to, to fulfill the intention, the purpose of the Old Testament. Okay. And that is what is carried into the New Testament. However, the Bible tells us that Jesus Christ is the end of the law concerning righteousness. Concerning righteousness. Meaning there is more of the law than just righteousness. Romans 4 verse 26. Therefore it is of faith. Oh, come on now. 10 verse 4. Romans 10 verse 4. For Christ is the end of the law for righteousness to everyone that believes. In other words, the aspect of how can a person be restored back to right relationship with God. Jesus Christ is the end of the law for righteousness. That does not mean that there are not other parts of the Old Testament that continue in the same line with the instructions of the New Testament. And, and so we do not just discard everything in the Old Testament. I believe that paying tithe is good. I believe that it is scriptural, and from what I've seen in scripture, we should not pay tithe because it is a commandment. We should pay tithe because we love the kingdom of God. But we should not stop at paying tithe. Paying tithe is the minimum. Jesus said our righteousness should exceed. In other words, we should take it beyond where the Pharisees stop. The Pharisees pay tithe, but we don't stop there. We go beyond that. And we give generously, and we give lovingly, and we give cheerfully to God. But as for the basic of starting by paying the tithe, it is godly, and it is scriptural, and it's a good thing to do. And I encourage people to do so. I do that. Okay, well, I think before then, we're talking about once saved, forever saved. What's yeah. your opinion on this? Do you think that once you're saved, you are good to go? You don't or, do nothing. Yeah, or somehow... You will miss it if you deviate. The Bible tells us to continue. Jesus said in John 8 verse 31 to the Jews that believe in him. And he said, if you continue in my word, then are ye my disciples. And you shall know the truth. And the truth shall make you free. Continue. The Bible says grow in grace. So the context of scripture is not get saved and do nothing. It's, 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 it's never implied. It's never intended. You are saved to grow in that life. Grow in grace. Grow in the knowledge of God. Grow in the truth. Don't get saved and do nothing. He said we are transformed. 7 Corinthians 3 verse 18. Beholding as in a glass the mirror of the word of God. We are changed from glory to glory to glory to glory. You cannot teach people to grow spiritually in Christ. And the argument of once saved, always saved, has any basis. The basis of once saved, always saved is simply this. Now that you are saved, to what extent can you risk continuing to live in sin without losing your salvation? Was that the purpose of the message of salvation? Was that the purpose of the gift of salvation? That was not the purpose. Ephesians 4 tells us we should grow into him in all things. And when you are teaching people how to grow into God, you don't, you don't teach them to do nothing. Mm -hmm. Stay where they are. Remain the way they are. And, and, and nothing will go wrong. It's like taking your child to school and you tell your child, whether you pass or not, you are still my child. Stay in class one forever. No. We know he's still your child. But then why were you sent to school to grow? And the process of growth just does not give room for you to say, can I lose my salvation? You know, did you gain it to lose it? Were you, were you, were you, did you get saved so that you see, you know, some, some people went for driving uh, uh, interview in order to be employed in, 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 in his drive a certain company. And so they, as a first driver, how well can you drive near the edge without falling off? And he said, I can drive very close to the edge and I won't fall off. I'm good. And they have the second driver. How well can you drive near the edge without falling off? He said, I can put half of the tire 
on the edge and the other half off and I won't fall off. I'm good. And they asked the third driver and said, how well can you drive near the edge and not fall off? He said, I respect the company that gave me the job too much. I respect the products I am carrying too much. I respect the clients I'm supposed to supply the products to too much. I respect those that are looking up to me too much. To risk the company's car, risk the goods of the clients, risk my life by driving near the edge. I will drive far away from the edge as possible. And that's the person that got the job. The goal of Christian life is not to see how far can I continue in sin without losing my salvation. No, it is to ask ourselves, how much am I growing into Christ in all things? And that is the mindset of the Bible. When the Bible says, shall we continue in sin that grace may abound? God forbid. What was the whole essence of getting born again? It's so that we can be transformed from glory to glory to glory. This argument of can you lose salvation or not will continue on t- because, because those who are stubborn in, their com- in, in what they believe, they are determined to hold on to what they believe no matter what you say. The problem is that by the time we have finished our race, it will be too late for those who were taking an unnecessary risk to come back and say, oh, well, I think I've now discovered I can lose my salvation. Uh, let me leave right now. All right, Pastor, let's hold on there and take this call. Good morning. Welcome to Worship Experience. Good morning. Yeah, good morning. Good morning. Good morning. My name is Great. Your name is um, Great. Where are you calling us from, please? I'm I'm calling from Cardinal. All right, go ahead. Yeah, I thank Pastor In wonderful contribution. Yes. I want to really I want to really thank you because he has opened our eyes to see that in as much as we see some things that we have been doing that maybe have not been according to maybe the scriptures completely, we do not bring it out in an arrogant manner. This is something that we are used to. So when you come to change a a, a line of a line of thought, you come to give us understanding, not in a forceful way or in an arrogant manner. For example, I'm a, I'm a student of Pahigin. And I've learned from Kere Tegin that whenever he wants to correct something, the way he comes, he comes with wisdom, not forcefully or take it as it is. No, there's a way you come to correct the line of thought. I just want to thank him on sharing some particular things. God bless you, sir, and I pray that God will continue to keep you in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Thank you so you much. Thank great. you so much, great. Okay, so we are still at the ministry, and then... You know, full life is it's literally 24 years. And I'm sure that you have experienced, you've seen all kinds of people. Once you told us the story of how a church member, you know, duped you, and then years later, he still came back to the same church and you still had to love him and, you know, pray. We've seen on social media of how one of your closest pastors left and then, you know, bloggers said a whole lot. And today we've seen you and the past is even your spiritual son and we've seen both of you laughing and shaking hands how can somebody handle offenses in the ministry maturely in such a way that you know it doesn't affect your ministry affects because it's possible we've seen pastors who are very um um, agile on stage but he's not talking to his wife or he's beating his wife and years later we just get to find out that oh this is what he has been doing so how how are you able to manage different kinds of people in church and still forgive and love despite what they do to you the bible tells us that offenses will come so whether you want it to come or not it will come mistakes and offenses is part of the group process of life you see mindset and perspective matters a lot mistakes and Offenses is part of the growth process of life. People don't offend you because they hate you. People offend you because in that area, they are immature and they have a problem in that area. So how do you handle offenses? Number one, prepare, it will come. Number two, because it will come, prepare to forgive. The Bible commands you to forgive. Why? But why should it happen? Why should it happen? Why should it happen? 
The question is, this person will make mistake. This person will offend somebody. The question is, why not you? Why not you? So most times, we get caught up with me, me, why me? And we miss out on the whole process. Forgive this person. Number three is an opportunity to teach and train that person. And number four, one thing I absolutely believe is that no man, no matter what they do, can undo the plan and purpose of God for my life. Once you have that faith and assurance in God, the Bible says all things work together for good. And all things means all things work together for good to them that love the Lord. So if you keep loving God, and because you love God, you forgive people, because you love God, you instruct people, because you love God, you use every opportunity to teach people, God will make good come out of that hurt. It doesn't mean it will not hurt you. You will be hurt, but God will make sure that that's not the end of the story. And also to you that have been offended, it's an opportunity to grow in wisdom. Restructure your system, redesign your system, put more checks and balances in place. And you realize that you are in a better state to forestall a repeat of such offenses. All right, let's take this call. Good morning. Welcome to Worship Experience. Hello. Hello, Hello good, good morning. morning. Good morning. My name is Juliet. I'm calling from Abuja. Okay. All right, welcome, morning, Juliet. Juliet. Yes. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, good morning, Pastor. God bless you. Good morning, Juliet. And sir, I want to know how can a believer receive forgiveness and cleansing? Yes. Yeah. If, if a believer, if a believer has sinned, if a believer has sinned against the Lord and the Holy Spirit convicts him. The Bible tells us in 1 John chapter 1, verse 8 and verse 9, if we confess our sins, he is faithful and just to forgive us and cleanse us from all unrighteousness. The believer should come to God like his father. The prodigal son came to his father and said, I have sinned. And the moment he said that, he was forgiven. There is room for repentance. There is room for receiving forgiveness. And then when you ask God to forgive you, believe he has forgiven you. I think that that is a real issue. Guilt is not that you were not forgiven. Guilt is the fact that you still do not believe that God has forgiven you. But more importantly, learn from that experience, rise up from it, and go forward. Don't wallow in it, and don't repeat it. Rise up. This is like a wound. Bandage that wound, apply medication, and for God's sake, don't uncover the wound again. <laughs> and don't inflict another wound on yourself, even though you will still be wounded. All right, Pastor, we, we, we're already out of time, but i just like to ask this one relationship um, related question. Marriage seems to be on, uh, divorce rather, is on the increase. Mm -hmm. And you wake up, the church is not left out, the regular guys in the society are not left out. And people attribute this to the root, the basic things that should have been done during courtship, during dating, um, going for marriage classes, which, of course, we've seen in churches. Even in the midst of this, people tend to ignore these classes. Now, part of the reasons why we're having this conversation is because marriages or people who intend to get married believe that there should be boundaries and limitations and what the husband to be or the wife to be should know or shouldn't know about their intended partner so i'd like to ask what is your standpoint in relationship and marriage when it comes to transparency honesty accountability and trust uh, you have put many things inside <laughs> your but basically every hope is built by knowledge. Information, and you gain knowledge from that information, and you make effort to practice. That practice now forms character, and that character now shapes behavior. That's how the hope is built. 
It is not only in marriage that we have relationship. You have relationship in school. You have relationship on the street. You have relationship with your neighbor. Relationship is everywhere. But in marriage, we take principles for granted. For example, your colleague in the office raised his voice on you. You didn't fight. Why? Because you know that if you fight in the office, you will lose your job. The desire to keep your job made you control that anger. The reason why you got angry and fought with your spouse was because you knew that there's no job to lose. You on the way coming, somebody met you in the bus stop and abused you. You abused back, but you abused on your way home. You didn't stand there and fight because you size up the person. He's bigger than me or maybe has a knife in his pocket. Rubbish. It's safety. So people take their spouses for granted. So one is to know the principles. One is to know this, and these principles can be known. That is why those classes are taught. Those classes are important. Sit through the class. Knowledge affects you. Knowledge equips you. Knowledge builds you. The Bible says in Proverbs 24, 3 and 4, every house is built by wisdom, made strong by understanding. The chambers are filled through knowledge. So do not despise the importance of being taught. Don't despise the importance of reading. We still read married books today, I and my wife. Mm. So read, learn. It's not faith. It's not a sham. The reason why you drive well is because you, you learned how to drive. The reason why you cook well is because you learned how to cook. You didn't just carry the condiments and put in the pot and cover it and the fire made it. No, you learned how to cook. So if we gain knowledge and we submit ourselves to being taught, we can do better. However, knowledge on its own does not make anybody better. You have to make effort to practice what you now know. And make room for mistakes. Mm -hmm. There's nobody that is, not, is going to grow without making mistakes. So because of that, give room so that when there's mistakes, there's forgiveness. And then we build on from there. And we get better with time. If people will stay married and gain knowledge and make effort to practice it, with time, every marriage can get better. Okay, so I have one last question, and I okay. want to ask this question. Because in the Gen Z world, we believe that, you know, you have to test it before you go in, you know, like, for instance, I'm was a man. Two people have to be intimate with each other to know if, you know, you can deliver along the line. That's the, you know, mindset. What's your take on extramarital affairs um, before the point of Sex marriage? before marriage is wrong. Mm -hmm. Cohabiting is wrong. Living together is wrong. But how will you get to know this person? We've known many people in life without living with them. Without living with them. Some of our best friends, whom we have known intimately, we never live with them to know them. We interact to know. We don't live with to know. In fact, you need a healthy distance to interact wisely to know. Once you confine people in an environment, the closeness will generate friction. Mm -hmm. What we should ask ourselves is, we should give a reasonable time to get to know people. And we should learn to marry from the people we know better. But many people want to marry from their emotions. They want to marry from the spark of the moment. They want to marry from the strike of chemistry. And then saying, there's no time, there's no time, there's no time. But the person you've known for 10 years, for 5 years, through school, through, through uh, uh, church experience, you take them for granted. But those are the people you really know. And then you now meet this person. And uh, you see, every new thing strikes excitement. Mm -hmm. And so you meet this person and you're newfound love and you're excited. And you don't know that one day that newfound love will be like that friend you've known for 10 years will get to like be like that your brother so so you realize that this these fantasies need to be taught out of us it is healthier it is safer to marry from those you know and that's why surrounding yourself with the right circle of relationships matter a lot long before you decide to choose who to marry okay. so that you choose from the pool of 
healthy relationships that you have surrounded yourself. And to a great extent, you stand a better chance of having a better home. Okay, thank you so much. You know, he said you have to marry from your um, from from the relationship that you built over time. Shout out to all of you traveling out of the country to pick wives. I didn't mention your name. Though. <laughs> <laughs> okay, so this is Worship Experience Special Edition, and right now we are on a series called Believers Advantage. Now, I don't know if you are a pastor, you are a senior pastor, wherever you're watching us from, and you would like to be a part of this show. Our phone numbers are on the screen for you to call in or messages so we could get to connect with you and also someday wherever you are in the world we can bring you to the beautiful hills of Ibdiakura and trust me you would love to be here thank you so much Eventia, for being a part of today's show it's such a privilege to share um, the stage with you today so before we end the show your last words before we say goodbye I want to say to everyone that was a part of today's broadcast God loves you no matter the mistakes you've made no matter the errors you've made don't give up on yourself. Just because you made some mistake does not mean you should discard your life completely. Don't forget, your life is deep, divided into different segments. Some things are wrong. Not everything is wrong. You have a good family. There are people who love you in your family. God loves you. Rebuild your relationship with God. Reconcile with family. And from there, begin to rebuild different aspects of your life. Listen, if the wrong decisions and choices derail your life the right decisions and choices can restore your life i love you and god bless you and i look forward to one of these days sharing fellowship time with you god bless you okay so this has been worship is Spring special edition on spectrum tv now you can follow us on all our social media platform all of which you can find on our website at www.spectrumtvlive.ng I am a medium James, your beautiful host for the day. And like I said earlier, it was such a honor to co-host this show with one of the most handsome men mm, of planet there she Earth. Goes again. <laughs> thank you so medium so much and um thank you for joining us. And uh in the words of the pastor, continue to do the best to be the best version of yourself.